Tarzan of the Apes, brought to you from out the pages of Edgar Rice Burroughs' enchanting book. <laughs> Filtering through the tangled mass of leaf and vine, the darting rays of the rising sun stab the jungle gloom in little jets of furnished gold. From above sounds the screech of brilliantly plumed parrots, the ceaseless chatter of apes and monkeys. Below, from the dark green recesses of the jungle's tortuous paths, comes the soft padding of cat-like feet on the spongy moss. A shadowy movement in the tall bamboo, a glinting of black and gold, as Sheeta the leopard seeks a cool retreat after his nightly kill. A flash of green, more vivid than the sheltering leaves, a soft, slithering sound like lapping waves on a shingle beach, and Hista the snake slides into the rank grasses. On the little platform in the trees, Jane Porter and Tarzan watch the ever-changing jungle awake. Jane, hungry? Eat? Yes, White Skin. Oh, and you've already gathered the fruit. Fruit? Lump? Yes, White Skin. Plum, fruit, banana fruit. One by one, Jane holds out the fruits as she names them, and Tarzan picks them up as she lays them down. Ban, banana. Banana? No, plum. This banana. Banana. Plum, plum, plum. Yes. White skin go. Come back many fruit. White skin go. Come back give Jane many fruit. Give? Give? Give. Jane, give white skin plum. And Jane, as she says give, hands to Tarzan a wild plum. Tarzan's eyes brighten as, for the first time, he recognizes a new word not at the end of a sentence. White skin, give, Jane, plum. White skin, give, Jane, fruit. Yes, yes. Now you're really talking. Talking? Talking? That's right. Jane emphasizes the movements of her lips as she says the words. Talking. Eat. Eat. Talking. <laughs> No, 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 no. No, 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 no. No, no, white skin, eat. No, no, white skin, eat. Jane moves her lips without sound, and Tarzan watches intently to catch this difference he cannot quite understand. Now this is talking. Jane, hungry, eat fruit. White skin, hungry, go quickly, come back, eat fruit. Yes, yes, white skin, talk, talk, talk. And Tarzan nods his head several times to convince Jane that he at last understands the difference between eat and talk. Tarzan turns as the young ape Gizan swings onto the platform. Kika, Belu, Gizan. Tarzan tries to explain that the young ape is Gazan, Tika's baby. He turns again to the ape. Agala, full lot, but Tondo, Jean. White skin, go. Drum. Come back, quick. All right, white skin, but come back, quick. Yes, yes, yes. Jane cannot understand what Tarzan is going to do, but where before she would have been terrified at being left alone, now she accepts it with Tarzan's assurance that he will come back quickly. As for Tarzan, he does not have sufficient command of his new speech to tell Jane that Takla, the bull ape, is mistreating one of the tribe, and that he, Tarzan, as leader of the great apes, must do as Gizan asks, go to the dum-dum and settle the difference. As the ape-man swings off into the jungle terrace, Gazan seats himself on the platform and proceeds to satisfy his curiosity about this white hairless she with whom Tarzan spends so much of his time. Off in another part of the forest, Professor Porter, Philander, Clayton, and Darno press on toward the cannibal kraal. This almost impenetrable wall of trees and vines and everything seems endless. We don't seem to be making any headway. Well, we are making some headway. And in any case, Philander, don't forget that while we we are more or less bringing up the rear, Clayton Downo and the sailors ahead are really making it quite easy for oh, us. I suppose so, I suppose so. By the way, Professor, I've been thinking... Yes? I didn't want to mention this as long as Clayton was within hearing, but, you know, it strikes me as being more than a mere coincidence that our jungle friend rescued me from the blast. Then come to the point, Philander, come to the point. What are you trying to say? And why should you be averse to letting Clayton hear? Because Clayton seems to have taken the most unreasonable dislike to this uh, pagan person. What I used to say was, perhaps Clayton is, after all, correct. 
And Jane has already been rescued by him. And yet... And yet, you know, and yet... What can it seems done? almost unbelievable that there can be two people living in this jungle. I mean, Tarzan of the Apes leaves a notice on the door of the hut warning us that he's watching. Then this pagan who neither speaks or understands English is always at hand just as if he were watching. And unless he is Tarzan of the Apes, then why have we not seen Tarzan? But for days, yes, and nights, the same thing has been puzzling me, Philander. I am almost convinced that this, uh, this knight of the jungle is Tarzan. But, Professor, how do you... Uh, there the... you go again, Philander. One minute you try to convince me of something, and then, when I am about to offer corroborative evidence, you begin arguing against your own postulation. But listen, Professor. Can you explain how this man can read and write and still not understand or talk English? Yes. What? You asked me a question, and I gave you a most emphatic answer. Yes. Then explain yourself, Professor. Explain. Well, a compatriot of Darno's, a uh, shop for your by name, translated the Rosetta Stone. Of course, of course, of course. Well, I and, know that. And, I know that. And George Smith transcribed and translated innumerable tablets of Punier for. Yes, yes, I agree. But what then? What then? Uh, but can you or anyone else talk ancient Egyptian or Chaldean or Assyrian? Oh, of course not. But... Let me ah, ah, but you and I, as archaeologists, can read and write both. We cannot, however, speak the language. Why cannot, therefore, Tarzan of the Apes have the ability to read and write English without being able to utter a word of it? Professor, you... you almost convinced me. Still, I don't see how you could have learned to read and write uh, and not know... That, my dear sir, uh, Philander, is a different problem but one which is in no way detracted from the soundness of my previous theory. Commander! Porter! Hey, yes, Commander well, Guard just reported that they've sighted the village. Yes, sir. Oh, you are in How far off? It's rather early yet, still, yes. definitely. Then you don't know how many natives there may be. Ah, think? monsieur, monsieur! The end of our search is in sight. So Clayton just said... Now, monsieur, we do not want to act as if in any haste or with any fear of being outnumbered. But we want to be on our guard. Mais oui, ça va son dire. That goes without saying. But we must not have the appearance of an attacking party. I'm afraid I don't understand. Here we come all this way to effect Jane's rescue, if possible, and now, when we do get within hailing distance of the place, we're not to do anything. Now, Clayton, you're altogether too impetuous. I'm sure that Lieutenant Darno does not mean to sit down and wait for the blacks to release Jane. Merci bien, Monsieur le Professeur. Monsieur Clayton, we have no means of ascertaining how many there are in the village. Therefore, to attack is foolish. They could shoot us down with comparative ease. That's not what I meant, Darno. All that I'm trying to say is that I think the time has arrived for strong measures, not mere talk. Strong measures, my friend, are ideal when you have at your command a strong force. Now, we have only a small party, but we do represent the authority of the French nation. I propose to reason with these blacks, convince them, if I can, that resistance and our deaths will be avenged by the arrival of many ships and innumerable soldiers. With all due respect to the avenging arm of the French government, it would do us little good if we put our head, so to speak, into the lion's mouth. And the lion gets shot after he has eaten us. At the same time, Clayton, if we ruthlessly attack these people, the first thing they'll do probably is to kill Jane. Oh, yes, yes, Delanda, I thoroughly agree. That is the thing I have most feared, though I have not brought myself to speak of it. Then, monsieur, with as little noise as possible, but with no attempt at concealment, we will go on. Nous avançons, n'est-ce pas? To Jane Porter lying on the platform in the tree, the breeze carries faintly the distant sounds of the search party. The girl scrambles to her knees, leans out as far as she can, listening intently. Again, the voices. Can it possibly be? Does it mean that they did not leave on the steamer? For a moment she's certain she hears Cecil's voice and then Philander's deep-voiced answer. She glances about. If only White Skin would come back. Again she listens. But the only answering sounds now are the jungle noises. The sounds die in the distance. Faintly in the lull comes the sharp crackling of underbrush, the confused murmur of, of what may be voices. Once more, Jane glances down the jungle trail. Still no signs of white skin's return. In an instant, she makes up her mind. She knows it is a search party. Quickly, Jane grasps a branch. Yes, and the young ape, realizing the danger into which this hairless she is plunging, tries to stop her. Jane lowers herself, her swinging feet reach for a foothold. Jane then tries desperately to stop her. Tarzan is left holding his chair, but Jane, heedless of danger, slides and scrambles to the ground, and ignoring the warning chatter of the hands, rushes headlong into the jungle. Oh, fury! 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 Oh